paint your face. I want you to know how to do this. What distribution is this right here? Huh? It's a normal. This is e to the minus, e to the minus in here. Be clear, you're integrating over the beta. Theta's gone from everything. So where am I integrating from? Minus infinity to infinity. So this is e to the minus, this is an e to the minus. They're both normals. This one will come out as a normal. So you'll get some term in here. What does the term look like that you factorize out of everything? So if you ended up working through the integrand and working through the kernel, which normal would this be? Which, which normal? We'd have a normal with some expectation and some variance. Let's just write that down. You could figure out what it is. So this is a normal with some expectation and some variance. How do you recognize what it is? Expand, sort, find a quadratic term, invert it, you'll find the variance. Look at the minus two linear term, pluck that thing off, multiply it by the variance. In high D, when we come back from break, we're gonna do the same thing in vector land. Just make sure you multiply in the right direction. So you'll get that, the expectation, so you get the expectation of the variance by doing that. What does this integral look like in terms of these two quantities? Not hard to figure out what those are. Precisions add, invert that sort of thing. So what does this look like? Again, this is something I told you when we wrote it down. I said this is that term. Do not forget it. We will be coming back to it. And I don't know how to make that more impressionable other than I think maybe just quiz you on it 10 times in a row, take every Friday from that day until now, and then maybe I would get 90% of you. <laughs> you know, with this, I just don't know. But what is this right here? I begged you. It's e minus Yeah, what is it? Okay, we got the e part right. That's that completion of the square term. Yeah, so expectation squared. That expectation over the variance. What was this term? What is it? It's plus one half. And this was one of the pluses that I circled. Very good, though. But that plus would mess you up for a little while. It's the plus because you're inverting out of the completion of the square term. So you complete in that square, plus and minus, some x bar stuff, pull that term out, flip it over. It's plus. We will come back to this so you recognize what the expectation and the variance is. And then you get this thing. Then you tease this thing apart. Make sure you get all your variances. So right, but the variance in this is specified so we can throw them all away. If I didn't have those variances right, I would have, if I didn't know that variance and I was integrating over that variance, I would have made a mistake. So, but we can do it just like we said throw away a bunch of constants, recognize, then re-recognize what this thing is by expanding it out. Look at the quadratic term, look at the minus two linear term, and figure out which normal that is, just like the predictive distribution. So obviously, if you're like scrambling through all of this and working through it and you haven't practiced since, you know, a month ago, you're not going to be able to do it in three minutes, right? It's going to take a little bit longer. Let me just ask this question. What is, can I just substitute out and say this is going to be x bar right here, work on the normal distribution for x bar? No, the only thing that changes is that's divided by n. So I could have done that, made life a little bit quicker. I probably could have recognized the distribution of x bar is probably normal for all kinds of reasons. So um, not even asymptotically, everything is normal here. It's normal, the x bar is normal. This is the margin on x bar or x. They supply the same information about theta in our example. Theta is going to be the generic thing I'm going to test it against over here. So this marginal distribution is going to be important in a lot of our testing scenarios because it appears in the beige factor. So let me just show you a trick. 
This is the correct way to do it. Recognize the kernel, recognize the, what E and V are, convince yourself or work through the details that this is E to the plus one half E squared over V. This is not new. This should be on your refrigerator. Jared, it's on yours, right? I think it's on my paper. It's yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's somewhere. But this should be almost instantaneous. One of two integrals I want you to just know the answer to. So hopefully my powerful, resounding voice has instilled this in you. I really want you to know what this is. I'm going to have you do this on the next homework. It's the solution to the next homework. It's the part where I'm going to say on homework five, I've already told you everything. Let me make a few notes about our route through class since we're a little bit off on our deadlines. That gives Zach a little bit of anxiety. It's starting to give me a little bit of anxiety too, so let's alleviate. So I'm gonna say homework four is due on December 1st. So that's the Friday that we come back during that week. We will do a review session right before. You know how to do all of these problems in spirit. I've told you everything you need to know except for one part where I have you computing p-values on four different hypotheses. You're just doing the sharp test, the CDF, two times the CDF thing is the, the p-value. You're just plotting that for those different values of theta. I think they're like 10, 15, 17, and 20. Are those the numbers I picked on the homework? Okay. You're killing me. <laughs> That's true. Yes, okay, good. You should look at the homework. It's the right way to do things, and you can be thinking about it, see the thing in lecture, and go, oh, this is that problem. If you take out that 15 seconds of looking over the homework, it's actually like 15 minutes probably, to digest it, you will pay that price in hours. That's a fact. If you want to keep paying it, proceed. So look at the homeworks. That's why they were there. OK. Um, do on December 1st, we'll do a review. On December, nope, this is November 30th. I was about to do the thing. You know the thing. Third, thank you. Um, so we'll be able to get through that right there. I will mention there's a um, heads up comment. Write down the correct model. on the homework that's due when you come back from break on that December 1st, so plenty of times to do it. What I tell you is heads up, write down the correct model you should have done the inference off of. I want to point out that that problem is sampling data from four different thetas. So it's a mixture of four different normals that we're sampling from. We scramble all the values and we have this mixture distribution. So it's four normals. It ends up looking like this. That's what you're sampling from. I don't know if my heights are right. They are not all the same because there's different sample size for each normals. One of these normals is 10. This was 15, 17, 20, something like that. They all have the same variances. I want you to sample data out of that, and I tell you how to sample data out of it. What I ask you to do is compute p-values for four competing different hypotheses. So if you're computing the, the p-value, the sharp test p-value, you're going to do it for 10, and you're going to draw some plot, and it's going to look like this. That's going to be the p-value as n increases. So you're going to be sampling xi's out of this mixture distribution. You're going to scramble it so there's, it's not apparent which mode you've sampled from. So you'll just sample from four different modes, and then you'll shuffle your data, and it'll look like a mixture representation. Um, you'll compute the p-value corresponding to 10, that the data came from that. The p-value is getting smaller and smaller because the data didn't come from a normal model with mean 10. It didn't come from a normal model with mean 15. It didn't come from a normal model with mean 17. 
and it didn't come from a normal bottle with mean 20, it came from a mixture of normals. So the p-value will be cascading for all four hypotheses, and it's doing the right thing. It's telling you data's not that, can't be that. So the Bayesian thing is gonna be a little bit different. I'll just point out the correct prior When you do the Bayesian hypothesis test, it's pi theta is going to be sum i goes from 1 to 4, delta function theta i is equal to, I'm going to give these some values. This is v1, v2, v3, v4. So theta i is v i or I'll just say those values right there, they just so happen to be coinciding with the same index. So this is a delta function on four different values, and we want our priors to sum up to one, so we just take that to be our total prior. So I'm gonna place a point mass on 10, a point mass on 15, a point mass on 17, and a point mass on 20, and that's gonna be my prior distribution. I'm testing those four sharp things. In the Bayes factor, you're going to be computing basically, um, is it 10 compared to everything else it could be? So the 15, the 17, or the 20. You're going to see which one is most compelling. So the Bayesian answer, your plots are not going to all be cascading. Three of them will be doing this. And then one of them will be climbing up towards one. So just so you know the correct be behavior. So the Bayesian, it's going to say in the class of alternatives, which is these four different values, which value out of the four values is the best fit. So the Bayesian is answering a different question. So just as an engineer, we just want to understand the mechanics of what their procedures are. So the Bayesian is going to say out of my universe of four potential hypotheses, which one is the best fit? And as you get more and more data, it's going to climb to one for the one that fits the best. If you actually take the average of all of this data, the average is somewhere around here. And so I think that if you misspecify the model, sampled from a mixture, and then said, I'm going to hypothesize that this came from one model, and I'm going to hypothesize about its means, it's going to be, pick the best fitting model. So it's going to pick the hypothesis that's closest to the true average. This is model specification. You're doing the wrong thing. You're getting data from some model, and then you're testing it under some other modeling situation. So I want you to see that p-values kind of, they're able to reject hypotheses and tell you something is off. And so that's why all the p-values will be cascading towards zero, where the Bayesian thing, you're comparing the null to the alternative directly. And so you're picking the best candidate out of your subset. So in a um, classical p-value type test, you only use the null in computing the p-value. The alternative just tells you tail directions. So if you're doing the sharp thing, you're just checking to see how far you are away from that null hypothesis. So the two-tailed test. Anyway, I just wanted to talk about that. Um, I do say heads up, write down the correct model. That's the Bayesian mixture model. I'm going to say remove this from the homework. You don't need to do that. I'll address it, but that's one of the things I'm going to chop out of this class. So, and I'm going to get into hypothesis testing for model selection when we come back from everything. So you can just say, forget about this, but please just at least pay attention to the comment and think to yourself, what we did in that homework problem is show the behavior of Bayesian answers versus non-Bayesian hypothesis testing when the model is incorrect. I think the p-value is the winner. So Bayesian answers aren't always great. If the alternative space is misspecified or the model is misspecified, it's just going to pick the most appropriate from that model class. It's not going to fix up the misspecification. The p-value, I sympathize a little bit with Fisher, sometimes you don't know an alternative and you just want to say, this is just not right. So let's just think about that. Um, Let's hypothesize about something. Um, what would be a good thing to hypothesize about? Um, I'm a conservative Republican. Very, very conservative Republican. So I'm part of the Freedom Caucus. Do you believe me? 
Do you know what all that means? So they're like, they're, they're pretty far away. Right? So I probably lean left. So you probably already know that. You can just glance at the intel. That just doesn't seem right to me. I reject the hypothesis. You know, I asked one of my friends, Jack Good, about this a long time ago. I was like, I kind of sympathize with what Fisher was saying. Sometimes you don't know, you don't want to write down an alternative hypothesis. And basically his answer was, in some way you always have a comparator in mind. Whether you can write it down or not, when you're able to reach conclusions and say that's not right, it's because you have a comparator in mind. You're able to compare against your experiences. And so the Bayesian forces you to write down the comparator. And so the Bayesian answer is always just compared to what, and it's a relative comparison you're making, where the p-value answer is just saying it's not right. Let me tell you the truth with p-values. You will never have the correct model with real data, so if you computed p-values on something that wasn't a simulation study, you would always reject as n gets big. There's something about the model that's wrong. And eventually, as you got the, enough data, you would be able to distinguish that thing. And that's where we get the practical significance, and statistical significance don't always mean the same things. So I think you do need to set up the comparison. I would say for the homework problem, the comparison is just not right because the model is totally misspecified. So it's basically what is the question you're asking. If it came from a one component normal model like this, and I tested that against four other normal models, it's just saying, this would be the best fitting normal model out of the collection of four different normals. And I think that does make sense. You just have to realize the Bayesian is asking a different question. They're forcing you to make a comparison, and they're saying what looks best in your comparison group. If you've made bad comparisons, no guarantee you're going to get anything reasonable. So, and I think that's always true. I think that's all of statistics. When people say something is big or small, it's always a compared to what, how did you make the comparison? And I think that's always everything. I don't care about neural nets. You're gonna have to take your complicated data and shop it up somehow. And so that shopping up of the data set is gonna have to have the resolution so you can make comparisons in the net. Every regression model does this. So just some, just some points. So you don't have to think too much about the mixture model. And I think you can do everything on the homework. For the homework five, I'm gonna make that simpler. I'll teach you about the stochastic search variable selection algorithm when we come back. It's basically an MCMC implementation of what I'm teaching you now in high dimensions. And I'm just gonna have you do that on the homework. I'm not gonna have you compare against Lasso. I'm not gonna have you compare against BIC and AIC. I think on the final day of class, I might tell you what some of those things are, but I'm not gonna have you do that, those comparisons. So we'll just do, I'm going to give you data from some regression model. I'm going to ask you to use SSVS to try to figure out which model I use to generate the data. Okay, so that's all upcoming. So I think with that, we're on track. Sound good? Your final homework assignment will be due on the 13th. That's the day of the final. The last day of class is the 6th just as you're planning out your mental map. So we'll come back, we have all week to turn in that homework, do a review session, and then we go through the Wednesday. If you guys would like another review session on that reading day, I'm happy to give it to you. So if you think that would be helpful, I'll show up for that. Guaranteed we can get a room. Nobody will be here. Okay, let's study this problem. This problem is gonna be the basic bread and butter for all the rest of the stuff that I'm gonna teach you in high dimensional model spaces. You can do everything that you, you learn with normal regression models and add um, gamma mixtures to turn them into T's or something like that. You can also do things where you have additive mixture models of things. So there's a lot of flexibility in what I've taught you. Really, you just need to spend some time putting it all together, but I kind of expect you'll do that in your, your projects in your home departments and try to apply this stuff there. I hope. So maybe one more class and you'll feel comfortable. So we're still just kind of getting into what are all the topics. Okay. Let me just show you something, a way that you can remember this and always get the right answer. This is not correct. So I don't want somebody to run up to me at the end and go, this is not correct. 
I don't believe this, Sam, this is not correct. <laughs> this will bother you. We'll see what does bother you. This is actually in Jim Berger's book. It's not right. You should work out the integral and do it right. But I will agree this is a nice tool to remember the answer in this case. So this is some normal. We know that. So which normal is it is what we want to know. So again, this is the distribution of x bar given um, sigma squared. And if you wanted to write this down, it's got your hyperparameters in there as well, so on and so forth. Um, so I'll put those down. Mu naught and psi squared. I probably should have called that v naught just to be consistent. But you can relabel it if you like. So these are the hyperparameters. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write x bar like this. I'm going to write this is x bar minus theta plus theta. Everybody believe me? That's true. <laughs> so let me do something else. Theta knots on there. Everybody believe me? That's true. What's this distribution? Normal. Normal. Okay, good. We all agree. So x bar was distributed. So if you want me to write down x bar is distributed normally with mean theta and variance sigma squared over n. Okay, so xi's came from normal with variance sigma squared, so x bar is compressing that variance down. So which normal is this? Mean uh, zero, theta. Yeah, sigma squared over n. Okay, what distribution does this follow? Remember I told you over somewhere that I said theta right here is going to be following some distribution, right? Mu naught psi squared. Here's a shortcut. I'm going to call that the random variable, so I mistreated everything. So here's, the, here's where the shortcut is wrong, is if I write that down and I think of that as fixed for a second and that's the random variable, then I can write this down. Now I'm going to change my viewpoint on theta and call it the random variable. And I know that this thing is normally distributed with mu naught variance psi squared. So this thing, sum of two normals, is sum the means. So this is going to be 0 plus mu naught sum the variances, sigma squared psi squared. This is divided by n plus. This is totally wrong math. That is the answer. So that is true. The answer is right. If you work through that integral, that's what you would write down. So you could at least write down the answer in 30 seconds if I ever quiz you on it and know what the answer is. You can check through everything, try that, but don't ask me why this is true because it's not. It just, it, it doesn't work for any other distribution than normals this way. I haven't read it in a really high level book where I was like, a uh, neat trick, but I don't think so. Um, anyway, if you ever want to remember what the answer is off the top of your head, you can uh, apply that. And make sure you know how to do the integration and recognize everything correctly. I will not accept that answer if I say show your work on a, on a final exam. Could very likely be there. Let me run through some stuff real quickly. So this problem right here, the one-sided test. So we know about the p-value thing. We've already studied it. We did that a lecture or two ago and wrote down what that one-sided p-value was and how to compute everything. And if you were doing the, the one-sided test, we could draw that power curve. And we walked you through that analysis. So here's what a Bayesian does. So Bayesian analysis is going to be, take the prior for everything. So I'm just going to write this down. Integral, I'll write down the likelihood, theta, x bar, 
I'm going to pick my prior, d theta, and I'm going to pick this proportional to 1. And I'm just going to tell you everything is okay when I use the flat prior on this case right here, when I'm doing the one-sided thing. What is this going to look like? This is going to be a normal distribution on theta. So this is going to be a normal distribution. It's going to be centered somewhere. Where's this normal going to be centered? Next part. Where's this? What's this variance going to be? Sigma squared over n. So this is what they do. They grab the posterior distribution. If you'd like to normalize this, you can over f of x bar. So marginalize everything. So basically, I'm just going to integrate this thing. So this is just the integral of the posterior distribution given x bar d theta. And where I'm going to integrate this, if I were doing this test right here, this one-sided test, let's give it a name, h naught theta is less than or equal to theta naught, and h alpha is going to be theta is greater than theta naught. So same sort of scenario. Here, I'll do this one. I think this is what I did last time. It doesn't actually matter. It'll be exactly the same sort of value. So theta naught, this is greater. And then the alternative is this right here. If I did this, all I need to do is integrate over the null. So what does that mean? I'm integrating from theta naught off to infinity. This will be that value. So I'll just say this thing right here is going to be the posterior probability of the null, theta naught, off to infinity. Sometimes I just say I'm integrating over theta naught, and I would just write this down. So I just grab the posterior density, and I integrate over the, the null space. Beautiful thing happens with this is if I wanted to know what's the probability of the alternative, it's 1 minus the probability of the null. And it would be the complementary area. And so, wonderful. This happens to correspond to the p-value for the same test. So you can convince yourself about how did we compute that p-value. We really just changed our viewpoint and we centered it at mu naught, and then we integrated from x bar over. But think about the symmetry of x bar and theta naught in the equation. They take exactly the same space on everything. So if I were just looking at this, e to the minus 1 half x bar minus theta squared over sigma squared over n, it's essentially what I'm integrating over, whether or not I like to think about integrating over x bar, or whether or not I like to think about integrating over theta, they play symmetric roles in that equation. And so you get exactly the same value. So that's good news. We could have done a different procedure. I could have computed the Bayes factor. So the Bayes factor would have been this. Integral, and I would integrate between theta naught off to infinity. I would end up looking at the likelihood I'm going to use that prior. I'm going to call this my prior on theta naught. And I'm just going to limit this. This would be theta naught right here. I'm going to let this be my null space right over here. This is my alternative space. So I'm going to let this prior be flat on the null space. So that's h naught theta. So I'm just going to use that flat prior on that part of the space. What we normally did is we extended the prior all the way across before. That's going to be the prior on my alternative space. So what I'm going to end up having here is I'm going to integrate from negative infinity up to theta naught, likelihood, x bar, theta pi h alpha theta d theta. If I pick this to be the same constant right here, 
I'll call it whatever that constant is, whatever this constant is, usually I pick that thing to be one. They both cancel in the base factor. So they cancel each other if you are consistent in how you pick the theta and how you pick that constant. If you're thinking about theta is exactly the same thing in both spaces. So theta is not leaving the model, it's just in different parts of the space. So why would I weight one higher than the other? And maybe you would in terms of the hypothesis itself, but you probably wouldn't do it through this prior, the constant. You'd probably call the constant exactly the same. So if you did this, everything would work out nicely. The point is, is that the constant cancels in the equation. And that's something you always want to check. If you ever introduce a constant in a Bayes factor, make sure it's canceling and it's not just some arbitrary factor. So didn't you say earlier that the that, that writer has to be proper? I love that you, you called me out on that. So let me correct the statement. So if you're ever selecting the parameter saying if it's in the model or not in the model, then you can't use a improper prior. In this case, theta is always in the model, no matter what part of everything. And so there's a balancing act there. So for selection, i.e. saying that maybe mu's not in there and it's a zero and I'm just gonna get rid of it altogether, and it's not a real parameter in my model and I don't need to think about it, in those cases you can't use a improper prior. So if the parameter appears in both hypotheses and has the exact same meaning, then you can use an improper prior. If it doesn't appear in both hypotheses in the same way, then you cannot use an improper prior. So I like that just as uh, if you're going to use it, make sure that whatever constants you introduce cancel in the base factor. So that's my more astute is that if it appears, make sure it cancels. So if you enter that thing as a 10, make sure that you're not inflating a factor by 10 because of that. So if you ended up going through this work, remember that what this is, is this is just a ratio of CDFs, is what you end up getting. If I wanted to work through this thing, do one plus, one minus pi naught, pi naught, where these are the prior odds, times my phase factor inverse that I converted, and I invert that, this will be exactly that. They will be equivalent to each other. So long as I pick this thing to be one half and one half. And what that's saying is now I've weighted those prior spaces equally. So if you did want to put more emphasis on one side of the space, you wouldn't place it in the constant. You would place it in that pi naught factor and you would upweight everything. Effectively, it's the same thing, but you will confuse people. If you end up saying, well, I picked a different constant, you should just pick a different prior mass on the hypotheses. So these are equivalent. The point is, is this is exceedingly easy to do, right down the posterior, integrate over the null space. It corresponds to all the theory I've taught you already, this other thing, and you can verify that for yourself if it makes you feel better, that they're exactly the same, you will get the exact same numbers out of this. Remember, this is just Bayes' theorem in disguise. How did we get this? Bayes' theorem. So, two different routes to arrive at the same place. Let's just look real quickly at the interval test. The interval test is exactly the same for a Bayesian. What I would like you to read is that paper that I put on the website called p-value, and it's, it's called p-values, what they are and what they are not. And they basically hammer on the interval test in a p-value sense. I'll tell you what the, what the Maven Pearsonian testing procedure is for testing in an interval, is you basically test how close you are to each endpoint simultaneously. So how close are you to the bounds? So if you're at a point a sufficient statistic that was in between the two bounds, it would be close to both of them simultaneously. If I started taking that sufficient statistic and pushing it outside of the bounds, it's getting farther away from that bound but getting closer to this bound. So it's actually going to increase the measure for a while on this bound, decrease it on this bound, and as you end up moving outside of both bounds, then they'll start decaying. I want you to realize that there's a non-monotonic property to doing that. One thing's going up, while well, another thing's coming down until they both go down together. So basically, the p-value corresponding to everything is just checking how close you are to here. So let's say you're doing the normal example, 
you would look at x bar and you would see how close it is to these two points. And you would do a normal hypothesis, a one-sided test on this, and you would do a one-sided test on that. And that's what the paper tells you to do. And it basically says, if you get closer and closer to this endpoint, the test over here is going to be getting, the p-value over here is going to be getting bigger and bigger. As we collide into that, it's going to be getting smaller and smaller as I move away. As I start moving outside of the interval, both p-values will simultaneously come down. If you did the sharp test and you collapsed everything together, you're still adding together two CDFs, and that's where you get the two times p-value thing from the one side of the test. If you take one of those CDFs and you blow it off to negative infinity, that corresponding p-value cascades to zero, and you get just one of the CDF terms. You can see that in the first two pages of the paper, and that's what I'd like you to look at. You don't have to derive anything, just understand the Neyman Pearsonian test is not good, it's not monotonic. Let me show you what a Bayesian does. So in that example from the paper, the p-value is certainly not a measure of the null hypothesis. If you took what Neyman and Pearson said into account, it does control error rate, but the p-value size does not mean anything to you. So the Bayesian procedure, the posterior probability on the interval test, is really easy to get. You're gonna, again, all we're gonna do is we're gonna build our posterior distribution, given x bar. I'll remind you, you get sigma squared. This is a normal centered at x bar with variance sigma squared over n. Right here, if I had some test and I wanted to test was true theta somewhere around here, probably the answer is like, an astounding yes if x bar fell right in the middle of that. You would have great reasons to reject that. But how does the Bayesian come up with this whole thing? The Bayesian will compute the posterior probability of the null. And what they're going to do is just integrate between theta 1 and theta 2 of their posterior distribution. Super easy thing to do. If you ended up going through the work and computed a Bayes factor on everything, you would use the same argument where I might compute my Bayes factor. It's going to look like this. I'm going to integrate theta 1 to theta 2. I'm going to pick some prior on it. If I used a flat prior, it better cancel out down here. I have to use the exact same thing. So if I multiply by 1 up here, I better multiply by 1 down here. And this is going to be integrating over the set of minus infinity to theta 1. You can leave out theta 1 if it makes you feel better. Union theta 2 off to infinity. So if you computed this phase factor and you thought about what your prior was of smearing mass across these hypotheses, theta is in both models in both hypotheses and it takes on the exact same meaning. So you can use the flat prior in this case as well. Piece of cake. I love this test. Lots of things that I like about it is if I made these bounds bigger, so let's say I made this one a little bit bigger and I kept that one the same, the posterior probability would get bigger. Obviously, it should. If it's a measure of the null hypothesis itself, if you make the set bigger and it subsumes the old set, the measure should get bigger. Take this to the limit as I went off to negative infinity to infinity, I should say the measure is one. The p-value thing will actually get that right too, but only in the limit. So what happens with the p-value that they talk about in the paper is if I make that a little bit bigger, the p-value goes down for a second and then it bounces back up. So the p-value itself is an incoherent measure of the null hypothesis. The p-value is not a measure because it doesn't have that monotonic property. Um, Bayesians will call that incoherent. And they will also say things like the p-value is non-additive. What they're saying is that their posterior measure is additive, but if I increase the space, it's only going to add positive mass to everything. So that's just a little bit of the language. I think the Bayesian does the right thing in this case. And I wish 
we made people think what is theta one and theta two for real problems. Of course, we can't test you on that in the classroom with arbitrary data sets because you just have no reason to even think about what that width should be. I kind of wish we did this and we forced people to think about that width. So, and tell us why they're picking this because that's establishing kind of how far you need to be away from something before you're willing to reject it. Let's talk about what people usually do. So this is the most popular test in all of the statistical lands. This is the thing that people, I think, thought Dave and Pearson were giving them a permission slip for. If we could write, raise them from the dead, they would tell you that's not what they wanted. So they were just trying to explain what Fisher was doing and saying it's really just air control. The alpha level is the measure. The p-value, ducking it, gives you the, de the decision. But the type 1 air rates, what they're measuring in there is gauged by alpha. And they're just telling you that it's uniformly most powerful, but you'd still need to compute what the power is if you wanted to talk about it. OK, shark testing. This is just this. Theta is equal to theta naught. Not theta naught. I need a prior on this. And when we kind of kick things off talking about what the prior might be, and you guys had some really good ideas, and basically you're rediscovering the interval test. And I ask you questions, how would you pick those interval limits? And it was like, I don't know. And I don't know either. I don't think there's a great answer to this. But this is the typical thing to do. So very typically, what I mean is if you ask any Bayesian in the department to just give you a quick solution to this problem, this would be the first one all of them right now. So very typically, they would pick this prior. Remember our priors look like this, probability mass on the null times however we smear mass on the null hypothesis. No data, this is prior. Plus prior mass on the alternative, 1 minus pi naught, the complement of the null. And then however we smear mass on the alternative space. Obviously, there's only one way to smear mass on a point. So people will do this. Theta is equal to theta naught, so they'll pick the delta function. And very typically, and I would say the reasons most people do this is it's easier to do than anything else. Asymptotically, if you buy into all that stuff, this is just as good as a lot of things. So, but for any particular data set, I think that this can be improved. But this is what I'm going to teach you in this class, because this is what you see most often, and it works OK. So very typically, people will take this to be the normal. This is the conjugate prior. Makes everything easy. We're going to analyze this answer. So I'm going to end up centering this at mu at somewhere. Where should I center this thing? If I'm testing theta naught, it probably makes sense to center it around theta naught and treat everything symmetrically around it. So center at theta naught. It does place a lot of mass in the alternative space on that. There are other things you can do. And then I've got some variance. And I will point out, this is the important thing. Very important. So if you're computing the Bayes factor, this is what you end up doing. You end up integrating over the likelihood function, x bar. We're going to give you sigma squared. I'm just going to suppress it from the notation. And then I'm just going to integrate this over the point mass. So that's how I smear mass on the null space. Just a point. That's it. This is the easiest integral in the world to compute. How do I do this in the alternative space? I do the same thing, x bar, right here. And now I end up picking my normal theta given theta naught psi squared prior. This is really easy to compute for the null. 
because it only takes on positive mass at one point. So that's just theta naught. Everywhere else it's zero. Easiest integral in the world to do, integrating over a point mass, anybody can do it. Plug and chug. This integral right here, if I had written everything down in terms of the sampling function, normalizing constants would cancel right here, and this would be that marginal distribution that we'd be working it with. So this is just f of x bar. It's a normal distribution, and it's got some mean and some variance. What is the mean? It's centered in theta naught. And what is the variance? It's sigma squared over n plus psi squared. That was our hypothetical quiz. So that's where that integral appears. I'm going to leave you with what the answer to this is, and then we'll be done. So if I computed this phase factor and wrote everything out, this is what we would get. This is the phase factor for the Sharp test. Keep in mind, this isn't really nice right here. This is a point mass right in the middle of a normal distribution. So we could work through that posterior distribution. That posterior is also going to be a point mass distribution. So we've got to place some positive mass on the null if we're even going to test it. A lot of people like to pick on the prior odds. I always look at this. So this is going to be the answer if we go through everything. So 1 plus psi squared times n, that's the number of data points that we have, divided by sigma squared to the half power, that's plus, e to the minus 1 half x bar minus theta naught sigma squared over n. This is squared upstairs times, and this term is important, 1 plus sigma squared over n psi squared inverted. I want to point out that this thing right here is z squared. So your typical z value, your z score being squared. So the Bayesian's decision is based off of this function. And they just work it through to get the base factor. I can convert this base factor into a posterior probability just by placing prior odds and posterior odds on things, inverting the base factor, multiplying it in, add one, invert all. So, and you'll get the posterior probability. What I want to point out is that for this hypothesis right here, in STAT 101, our first STAT classes where we learned about p-values, we probably did them with this example pretty quickly, that your p-value is absolutely determined by the z-score. So if z was 1.96 or something like that, or 1.97, let's go more extreme, so that we're over the boundary and we don't know what to do. 1.97, we're gonna reject our p-value is less than 0.05 for that thing. So, but the Bayesian says, wait a minute, there's more going on right here. It has to do with how I'm comparing to the alternative, how close I am to the null in the first place, but also it has to do with the sample size, a little bit more than Z entails. So Z doesn't tell us everything on its own. I'm gonna leave you with this last point and we're gonna write this down next time and pick up after Thanksgiving. But I just wanna leave you with a curiosity. The Z score is this. x bar minus theta naught over sigma over root n. I want to just think about what this means um, if this was 1.97. Let's say this is true for all n. This is just a mental fantasy. This wouldn't happen for any problem. I'm just trying to think of what does 1.97 mean? If I thought about it, if n was big or n was small, does it mean the same thing? But that corresponding p-value would be slightly less than 0.05. That's constant no matter what. But if I look at this and I think about what happens with this, what does this mean if n was huge? I just want to think about the limit of this. Let's think about the limit of this being big and that being fixed. What would this mean about everything? So I'm just trying to imagine what information is here? I get it, it's 1.97 standard errors from the mean, but that distance is tiny. 
It's epsilon for big N. Think about this, what is this going to? That's going to zero. So what must this be going to if this is going to be 1.97 to the limit? Zero as well. If you know what a derivative is, this is going there 1.97 times faster than the denominator. So it's what it's telling you. What does x bar converge to? It converges to the truth. Lots of ways to think about that law of large numbers, weak, strong, any strength you want, central limit theorem. X bar goes to theta. So that means this is going to theta, this thing is going to zero, so theta naught must be theta. That's what I think. So when I look at this thing right here, if you tell me n is huge, I'm going to think x bar is right on top of theta naught. So probably theta naught is really close to the truth. And so I would take that as information. The Bayesian makes you think about that through this term right here. And what we're going to analyze is the limit of this thing, that as n goes to infinity, when this is 1.97, this is actually going to go to something very, very big. And it's going to place massive amounts of mass on the null. It's actually going to converge to 1. Let's pick up there next time. Happy Thanksgiving, you guys. I hope you have great plans. I would invite you over to my house, but I'm not going to be there. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, you guys. I wanted to squeeze that in. I also have homework for y'all.